Chief Operating Officer of Blackstone, John Gray, and Business Editor of Sky News Australia and host of Business Weekend and Business Now, Ross Greenwood. John Gray, many thanks for your time. Um, this is the first time you've seen Crown since it was bought by Blackstone late last year. Um, you've been to Australia before many times. Um, what's your impression? Of this hotel? Of the whole thing that you bought, the whole box and dice, Perth, oh, Melbourne, Sydney. It's amazing. I mean, this is a company um, that is central to these communities, Melbourne in particular, just the scale of the asset, right? Six million square feet, all those hotel rooms, all that entertainment. Um, it needs some capital. It has gone through a tough period. The company has gone through a tough period, and we're very focused on fixing that. Um, I didn't get a chance to go to Perth on this trip, but hopefully next time. And this asset, of course, physically irreplaceable. I don't know if there's any asset in the world of this condition and quality. And I think as people rediscover Australia post-COVID, there are going to be a lot of folks who want to visit here. So um, I would say it has exceeded my expectations. Did you buy a bargain? <laughs> I love the form of Australian interviewing here. <laughs> I, I, I was fascinated watching that with uh, the Prime Minister because, you know, in the U.S., it's a little more gradual as they get to the tough <laughs> questions. So um, I, what I would say is we bought something that reflects long-term value, that um, if you believe in this country, if you believe in travel, um, these are essential entertainment assets. They've been through a very difficult period of time. The assets were not operated at a standard they should, certainly from a compliance standpoint. And that's our number one job, fix that. Um, we believe if we run the assets in the right way, invest capital, partner with the employees, partner with the communities, then it'll turn out to be terrific for our pension fund investors. But we still have a lot of work to do, and we definitely want more people coming to this country to help us. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's going to be a very good investment, but it's going to take time. You know, often great things take a lot of work and effort, some patience, and we've got that. So I'm confident we'll get there. So just for people watching here, um, in global terms, is the acquisition of Crown a big bite for Blackstone? Yes, it's a big bite. I mean, we obviously manage a significant asset base, a trillion and a half Aussie, as you heard. Actually, if you include the debt on the properties and the companies, it's probably over two trillion. So it's a big number. Um, but this is the largest investment we've made in Asia. Um, it comes from our private equity funds and our real estate funds. And we need this to be successful. So we really wanted get it done in the right way. We're trying to put the sins of the past that we had nothing to do with behind us. And if we do that and we run the assets in the right way, the management team does, we don't do that. But if we get it done, I think it can be really successful. Okay, go all the way back to the beginning. When you started at Blackstone, we've heard here about you know, the, one, the one trillion US under management that Blackstone has now. Um, how big was Blackstone when you started? When I started at Blackstone, it was 75 people and less than a billion dollars of assets. So less than I a often, billion? Less than a billion. So it's so now I, a thousand times bigger? Correct. I often say that luck is a core competency for me. <laughs> I landed at a good spot. So were you always destined to work for Blackstone? It's a funny question. Um, you've obviously done a little bit of reading here. Uh, my grandfather had a small auto parts manufacturing business in Chicago where I grew up. And... Uh, the name of the company was Blackstone Manufacturing Corporation. But that is not Blackstone no. as this is now, right? No, because what happened, unfortunately, is uh, manufacturing auto parts in uh, the west side of Chicago turned out to not be cost competitive. And the business got into severe financial trouble um, and it went away. But just before my grandfather passed, I was fortunate to get a job at Blackstone, the firm I work at today, and he was excited. So it was, I guess, in some ways, my destiny. So therefore, was investment banking, private equity, 
this type of investment that you do now, was this always your course, your direction? Was it always where you were destined to end up? No. I, I had grown up in Chicago. I'd never been to the East Coast. I didn't know anything about the investment business. I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. You topped the cl you cast classes there, of course, didn't you? I did fine. Yeah. I did fine. And um, I made a really good decision. I was an English major, and I was in Wharton in finance. Hang on, wait on. You were, you, topped, you were an English major who's now running the biggest private investment firm in the world. Yes, but um, I thought I was going to be a journalist, but I don't want to go <laughs> off on that. Much better idea. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and um, I just um, I got a business degree in Morton, and my senior year in college, um, in February of 1992, I met a young woman in romantic poetry class. I'm not sure this is what I should be sharing now, but... <laughs> Um, and two weeks after that, I got a job working for this very small firm. And I had no idea. I joined Blackstone. Um, initially, the focus was uh, on M&A and private equity. And about a year into it, the real estate world had collapsed in the U.S. And Pete Peterson and Steve Schwarzman, the visionary founders of the firm, said, let's start a real estate business. Somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, you want to do this? And that's what I ended up doing the next 25 years. And then five plus years ago, I got the opportunity uh, to be the president and chief operating officer of the firm. Okay. So on that course where the business grows its funds under management by a thousand times in literally 25 years, is there a moment where you go, we've got it, we're on our way now in a big way? Because it grew so exponentially quickly. Yeah. I don't know. I think, as most people know, when you're doing something, you're sort of climbing up a mountain, right? You're not necessarily looking down. Um, I would say as we got into the period of time in the 2005 to 7 period and we started doing much larger transactions, including buying Hilton Hotels, uh, we bought Equity Office, the biggest office company in a very different world for office buildings, uh, which we bought for $39 billion. There was a moment where we were like, wow, how did we get here? Yeah. A little bit like the way I feel right now, I must say. <laughs> so buying Hilton Hotels, and you're still the chairman of the Hilton Hotel Group worldwide, um, that to me seems like, as a kid growing up, you know Hilton Hotels. All of a sudden, you've bought it. Yeah. That's a pretty big deal, surely. Yeah. And on top of that, our timing was terrible because we bought it in 2007, just before the financial crisis. And uh, we had put a lot of debt on the company, and we had written off at some point in early 09 more than 70% of the investment. We thought it was, you know, most people had lost a bit of hope at that point, but we had faith that this was a great business, that travel was here to stay, that Hilton with all its brands, Hilton Garden, Hampton Inn, Doubletree, Waldorf, that it would come out of this, that this was a cyclical downturn. And I think it's a valuable lesson in a moment like this where it's easy to get negative when the sentiment is so negative. And as an investor, you want to be looking forward and thinking about what's ultimately going to be. And we had confidence that this was a terrific business. We reinvested $800 million at the downturn. Ultimately, the world turned. The management team did a great job. And we made $14 billion U.S. on the investment, the most successful private equity investment. And that's great. And we grew the company and grew employment and our you know, all the stakeholders were happy. But I will tell you, in the dark moments, it didn't feel great, right? And that's the lesson of today. So cast your mind forward from here with those same eyes on, looking at the way in which the US economy, inflation, interest rates, predictions of recession, how does that look right now? Well, maybe I'll give a little bit of optimism. Uh, I would say, first off, in the US at least, inflation is coming down. And, you know, we see it in our portfolio companies. We see it in shipping costs. Wages have been stickier, 7% six months ago, down to 55 But our forward look says it's going lower. If you look at U.S. CPI at 4.9%, the most recent number, and you strip out shelter, um, rental housing costs, which are lagging, it's just 3.4%. So I think you're going to continue to see inflation come down, at least in the U.S. You're seeing it in a number of European countries. Here it's been a little stickier. But that wage price spiral, which was discussed earlier, I don't think that's the dynamic we have. And central banks have moved. They were a little late, obviously. But they've moved pretty aggressively. 
and that medicine is slowing things down. So Blackstone right now has a war chest, as you describe, of 194 billion US dollars. Yeah. At what time do you deploy that war chest? Or is it a matter of trying to hang on and wait for perhaps even better opportunities to come down if prices do deflate from here? Yeah. I think you want to be open for investing before they put out the all clear sign. Mm. Um, you know, it, it, in my theory of the case, inflation has come down. The economy has been fairly resilient in the U.S. and in most of the world. Um, but the Fed is going to keep rates elevated and then other central banks have to follow. And that's going to lead to an economic slowdown. Um, and then the regional banking systems tighten credit as well. Tell me about the regional yes. banking system in America. So, so the regional banking system in America, what's really interesting is when you think about a banking crisis, you typically think about a credit crisis where somebody lent too much money to subprime borrowers. The house was worth 300000 They lent 400000 In the case of the two big banks that failed in the U.S., First Republic, Silicon Valley Bank, they owned U.S. Treasuries and super prime mortgages to wealthy people. They didn't have credit losses. They were just mismatched because the duration of those assets was 17 years. And their depositors, when they got nervous, could take the money out in 17 minutes, right? And so that created a huge issue. The good news is I think policymakers can deal with this because it's not an underlying credit problem. But the bigger issue, which I was talking about, is these banks are going to be more cautious in extending credit. So when you combine the Fed keeping rates elevated, keeping cost of capital elevated, and the regional banks pulling back so there's less credit available, that's what I think will take some oxygen out of the room and slow the economy. So is there, a, is there a credit squeeze as a result of that? Is it a squeeze or is it really that they turn the taps off? Because that literally almost created the global financial crisis. Yeah, this is much different than them. Back, back then we had an enormous amount of excessive leverage and a lot of credit problems. We don't have that. We have a Fed-induced slowdown. And in the rest of the world, you're seeing it here. You're seeing it in Europe. Central banks are tightening to kill off inflation. They're going to do that. We'll see economies slow. But... We don't have the imbalances of 08, 09. Back then, housing was way over leveraged. Commercial real estate was way over leveraged. Um, the banks were much more leveraged than they are today. So I think we have to recognize it's tough to sort of fight the tape. When you, when you have tight credit, it will result in a slowdown. But it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be as deep as what we experienced 15 years ago. OK, so that there are pockets of pressure, though. One of those right now, you talked about the Silicon Valley Bank, is San Francisco office buildings. You've seen syndicates which have been frozen in America. Um, and really, even the whole return to work post-COVID has really put pressure on that office sector. Is that an area that you would like to be in right now? I think office is challenging. In the US in particular, um, you know, there are increasing capital needs. Then we have this return to work issue, which is more of an issue in the US than it is here. Um, there's some quality of life issues in a place like San Francisco, as, as not many people have returned to the city. Um, I think it makes the office market, particularly older office buildings, much more challenged. For us, in 2007, we've talked about the past, we were 61% U.S. office buildings in our real estate portfolio. And today, it's less than 2%. Mm -hmm. And we've become a much bigger investor in things like logistics, where there's a lot of strength in the U.S. and here, rental housing, um, build to rent, what you call it here. But I think the office business is a sector that faces challenges. And I think the broader implication, even in markets like this, where the office market's healthier, I think you're going to see a re-rating, meaning the multiples will come down, the cap rates will go up. And I think investors here are beginning to realize it. It's not nearly as problematic as what we're seeing in the U.S., though. In your heart, I can hear that you're an optimist. Um, tell me about the competition. Do you have to be highly competitive to be successful in your game? I think in anything you have to be highly competitive. Um, you know, I think if you're an artist or you're a teacher or whatever it is, you want to be the best at what you do. And in our business, um, it's very competitive. Raising the capital from institutions, you have to have higher returns than others, 
winning transactions to invest capital, doesn't matter if it's in real estate or in companies or infrastructure, you've got to compete. And so that's the reason why I've been on the plane for the last six, seven days. Um, my team has not given me a lot of rest and sleep time, but I want us to be as successful here in Australia as possible. This is an amazing place. There's a ton of opportunity here. We want to grow our business here. And so we've got to compete. We've got to have the will to win. John Gray, great to chat to you today. Many thanks for your time. Ross, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all.